Good day, viewers. Welcome and thank you for joining us. You're watching Opus Young on Cape Town TV. My name is Danny Kamba. I've got Bernadine with me in studio, who is from the Saki Portman uh, Center of, of Women and Children. Okay. Yeah, so she's here to speak to us a little bit more about the history of this organization and what they are doing to help, you know, women and children who are facing different forms of violence and trauma. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful uh, to be here. And hello to our viewers. Oh, no, you are welcome. So for those that's watching at home that do not know you're seeing it for the first time, can you just give us a little bit of uh, a brief about yourself? Right. So Bernadine Bucker, I um, am an advocate. I yeah. started out my career in defending women and children's rights in courts in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, spent some time at the Family Advocates Office. Have always really dealt with women and children's rights. And yeah. um, three years ago, I moved to the Saki Bartman Center as the director of the center. Mm -hmm. And I've been there since. Yeah, now tell us about the Saki Bartman Center. You know, there's a lot of history that goes mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so how did it come about? Okay, so South Department Center is um, situated in the Cape Bat, um, formed 21 years ago because of the high levels of gang stalking, substance abuse, unemployment, poverty, uh, abuse against women and children that was characterized in the area. Yeah. And there was a real need for a center that would actually start addressing um, conditions that women and children were finding themselves in. Mm. So Saki Bartman Youth Center was, was formed then. Um, in the 21 years that we've been going, we've managed to assist 230,000 women and children, oh, wow. survivors of, of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. um, and we're called the Saki Bartman Center after Sarah Bartman, mm -hmm. um, who obviously was the very first um, women that was sold into sex slavery. Um, she was sold to a colonialist um, it, from uh, South Africa, and she was taken over initially to London yeah. as a form of curiosity mm -hmm. to Europeans where they would put her into a cage and she would be stared at, people would pay to go and stare at her and to look at her because she had this very voluptuous form. Mm -hmm. She was called the Hottentot Venus okay. um, and um, she had, was later moved, moved to France mm -hmm. for exactly the same thing. Um, quite often she was just clothed in a lion top. Um, she died very, very young, tragically, of what they think was tuberculosis. Um, and then her brains and her genitals were pickled and put into jars by the French government and put into a, a museum. Yeah. And it took Nelson Mandela um, eight years to get her remains back to South Africa so yeah. that we could give her a proper burial. Um, and she's now been laid to rest in the Eastern Cape, which is where she came from. She was a member of the Khoi Khoi um, Plan. And um, yes, yeah, so wow. we wanted to honor her as the very first um, example of women that have been sold into slavery, mm. um, particularly sex slavery, um, and to honor the pain and the trauma that she experienced yeah. in a very, very short time, a very young life that we lost. Um, so we, it was a natural fit to call it the Saki Barton Center because she came, she spent some time on the Cape Flats. Wow. I mean, that must have been a horrible, horrible time. Yeah, it's a tra tragic story. I mean, yeah. yeah, she died in, in the late 1700s. 1700s. Mm. Yeah. Around about what age do you think she was? Um, early 20s, yes. Yeah. So mm. they say, they speculate probably around 21. I'd wow. Say, yes. mm. Oh, and I mean, human trafficking has been and continue to be mm. one of the major issues mm. that we are facing right mm. now. You know, and we always, always see it in movies mm. that people are taken, but you always wonder, does this really happen in real life? You know, do you have any idea as to what these people go through when they are taken away from their loved ones, you know, and put away mm. into these rooms mm. and cages? Yes, Danny, people do exactly that. You think we we all think it's something that happens in Hollywood movies um, or other movies, and it's not yeah. something that's happening in Cape Town just down the road. Um, but I can tell you that it is alive and well in Cape Town. Um, it's a very pernicious, it's a very... Um, a, destructive force that we're seeing a lot of um, in South African society. So typically women that are trafficked are younger women. Um, they are lured to traffickers by promises of jobs, salaries, money. Um, they are almost always um, given drugs by the traffickers to make them compliant, to make them easily controlled by the traffickers. Um, more often than not, they, they're brought into the suburbs. In around Cape Town, there's certain suburbs that are actually hotspots for human trafficking, mm. which are not very far from where we're sitting in the studio. And um, they're kept in rooms. A typical scenario is they would be kept in a, in a house with other women that are trafficked, mm. and they would be sold as um, 
sex workers um, against their will to men that would come in and they would be imprisoned the entire time that they're there, given very little um, care and attention, you know, very little um, medical care even. Yeah. Um, their belongings are taken away so that they can't get outside help. Um, and when they come out, they need intensive um, assistance um, in the form of therapy, um, medical assistance, yeah. um, legal assistance to get to get the perpetrators behind bars. Yeah. Um, but it's something that's happening, you know, all over in South Africa, wow. unfortunately. Wow. Sure. So, as in within your time in, mm. in the organisation, what has been the worst case of of any form of violence that you have experienced? Well, Daddy, we see a cases of violence against women every single day. So we have 120 women and children in the centre at any one time when we're running at full capacity, which we generally are. Um, our capacity is a little bit lower at the moment because we had that fire in May, yeah. um, which burnt out some of the rooms. So and you had um, a fire within the facility mm -hmm. oh, wow. in May. Um, so we haven't managed to get that. They've just started. The, the um, Department of Public Works has now mm. just started to help us to get that sorted out together with the Department of Social Development. So, um, so we currently have 70 women and children in the center at the time. Um, you know, the, the, the most strange thing about um, when women come into the center is that it se tends to run in trends. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very terrible word to say trends, but we will go through weeks or months where yeah. we'll be seeing more women that will come in with, for instance, burns. So for a while, women would come in and their hands and their faces mm -hmm. and their feet have been thrown with boiling liquids. Um, and that would go on for a while and then it would change to um, very brutal rapes or, um, and sexual abuse. So um, we see all manner of abuse. Um, we, we help women that have been subjected to also to any manner of yeah. abuse. Things like verbal abuse or, or mental abuse sometimes is as damaging mm -hmm. um, to a woman as physical and sexual abuse. So yeah. we don't, we, we would, would assist any, any woman that has been subjected to any form of abuse. Wow. And I mean, during this period of lockdown, it was mentioned that you mm. see, we saw it in the news mm. that the, the, the level mm. of GBV, mm. gender-based violence, has risen mm. within lots of provinces mm. uh, in South Africa. Mm. You know, during this period, did you guys also receive uh, an increase in cases of, of, of violence? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, we were watching what was happening in the beginning of this year. We were watching what was happening internationally with the lockdowns that were being, being declared mm. abroad. So we saw in China, the gender-based violence rates in China tripled during their lockdown. Wow. Um, in countries like France and Germany, they went up by approximately 30%. Mm -hmm. So South Africa has the uh, five times the global average of, of gender-based violence. We're, we're one of the countries with the highest rates of GBV in the world. Um, just to give you an example, 109 women are um, raped every single day in South Africa, and a woman is killed every three hours. Um, so when we were going into lockdown and looking at what was happening internationally, we were expecting huge amounts of women looking for shelters. Mm. Um, and initially in lockdown level five, we weren't seeing that. And we were getting really worried because we were concerned that why aren't they coming forward? Are they being confined with their abusers without access to transport or um, airtime so that they could call for help? Um, so that those were some of the things that we were concerned about. Yeah. Initially, the, the numbers weren't that high, but they did go up later. Wow, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Sata Bernadine. We're just going to take a short break. So for those that's watching at home, I urge you to stay tuned. Be part of the conversation. We'll be back after this. All right, guys, welcome back. You're watching Open Studio Cape Town TV. I've got Bernadine with me in studio today, who's from an organization called Saki Bartman. Um, Center for Women and Children, H.D. Afrikaans names. <laughs> <laughs> so she's here to speak to us a little bit about what the organization is doing to assist um, women and children who's going through um, all forms of violence and trauma and just help them, you know, find themselves again, get back on their feet, mm -hmm. you know, and stand tall. So again, welcome to the show, Bernadine. Thank you, Danny. Uh, you're welcome. And, you know, thank you so much to you and your organization for the work that you are doing, mm -hmm. you know, in trying to help bring back or give back power to, to our woman, mm. you know, just to continue with our conversation, we spoke um, about the, the increase in, mm. in gender-based violence during the period of lockdown, mm. where you mentioned that 
South Africa is five times mm -hmm. the global rate. Mm -hmm. Those are the global the yeah, the average. Yeah. Global, global average. Yes. Yeah. Just just to continue on mm. that, if you if you don't mind. Yes. So um, initially during lockdown, we mm -hmm. didn't see the numbers of women that were approaching shelters for assistance that we were expecting. And um, we've always said, and it's, it's been well documented, that um, substance abuse and particularly alcohol abuse and gender-based violence, yeah. they, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and it was marked that within exactly 48 hours of the alcohol ban being lifted in the Western Cape, Whoa. all of our shelters were full. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so it was almost there was a, there was a huge surge almost immediately that when when alcohol became available to the public. So yes, we did see then we saw a huge increase in women looking for um, for assistance from shelters. But it is an ongoing problem in yeah. South Africa. Um, we've all heard the president talking to us about how we need a whole of society approach, um, and that is my my opinion as well is that we're not going to begin to actually eradicate gender-based violence until every single one of us takes responsibility to do our part yeah. to actually address it. Exactly. Um, and we do that at the center, obviously. Um, it's the largest shelter in the country. Um, and we not only have a shelter, which is what we're mostly known for, we run programs for women and children in the community as well. Because if we don't start addressing with children um, how gender-based violence impacts on them and the resources that are available to them, yeah. we're not going to be able to start eradicating GBV because that intergenerational cycle of abuse is just going to be perpetuated through yeah. the next generation. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you mentioned alcohol being one of mm. the major mm. reasons mm. Um, for, for, for this mm. violence on, on women. So if, if we look at your center, mm. because of the fact that you get so many people coming to you with, with so many different um, problems, what would you say has been, you know, which substance mm. has been the major or the most mm. influential in this act? Right. Right. So we have a substance abuse unit at the Saki Bartman Center. And I'm really proud to say that it was globally mm. the very first substance abuse unit for women that were uh, survivors of gender-based violence in a shelter. Oh, wow. um, and we treat women that are dependent on a tech took marijuana and mandrax okay. um, because what we're seeing is a lot of women presenting with addiction to tech particularly. Mm. Um, so in the substance abuse un unit, the women would go through the same programs that they would go through in the, in the other shelter, yeah. but we would give them 12-step support to actually start dealing with the substance dependency. Mm. So we have a small... Um, staff complement that have had decades of experience yeah. in substance dependency and they assist the women through all the programs to actually leave the substance dependency behind yeah. and i'm really proud to say that 70 percent of our women don't go back to substances once they leave which is a phenomenal thing wow. um so that means that 12-step approach should be effective yes it's so certainly it? working yeah, what, what it's, it's, it's very much b uh, built on the alcoholics aa model mm -hmm. um but really worked on an individual basis with the women all day, every day, because they're obviously staying with us. Mm -hmm. And the, the, we have a registered nurse that will assist them medically, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the counselor and the social worker work with them in groups as well as individually all day, every day. Wow. So at least you're always making a difference in the people's I'd lives. I'd like to say so. Oh, wow. <laughs> so looking, looking, looking forward, you know, mm -hmm. with the organization, mm -hmm. um, I think can imagine it's continuing to grow. Yes, absolutely. So, what more can we find within the organization mm. you know, if um, there's somebody out there or mm. there were social issues mm -hmm. or facing um, mm. kind of, of violence and right. afraid to speak out? So what can we find within the organization? Right. So it's really important to us that we actually serve our community. Um, so we are pride ourselves on constantly having our ear to the ground to see what the needs of survivors are. Yeah. So we, to that end, we have a legal assistance program in the center where women in the community, as well as our residents, can get their protection orders, their divorce orders, and their maintenance orders. Mm -hmm. We run a children in the community program where for nine weeks we run a program with children in the schools, yeah. talking to them about gender-based violence, the resources that are available to them mm -hmm. if they've been exposed to it. We also talk to them about things like anger management, healthy conflict resolution, yeah. stress, and, and depression. Um, and then we run counseling for women that need it in the community so they can come into the center mm -hmm. and receive their counseling. And I think it's really important to say that everything we do in the center is free, gratis, and for notes. Nobody pays for anything. 
that um, they would need if they come to use our services. And then we have an outreach program where we go out yeah. and we take Saki Bartman on the road for those women, particularly in rural areas, mm -hmm. that don't have the services that they need. And then we have our children's programs, which is a ECD center, a homeschooling center. Yeah. Um, so we run nine programs at the moment, Danny. Wow. I was going to ask you about this, the, the kids program. Mm. You mentioned it so, so briefly. Mm. So in which areas are you currently operating when it comes to the, the kids program? Right. So for the children, the children come in with their mom. They stay with mom. Um, we work from the beginning to rebuild the the, 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 the family relationship because quite often that is obliterated through, through the abuse. Um, and so we deal with things like parenting for mom and um, rebuilding that those bonds. Yeah. The children have their own counselor. Obviously, they, they have their teachers, um, the children's counselor, the mother's counselor, and the teachers, both within the ECD center and the homeschooling center, yeah. are very closely linked to make sure that we are serving the whole family for everything that they need. Danny. So, okay. do, you know, what do they need? Do they need specialized sort of form of care or therapy? Um, is it a specialized form of medical attention that they need? And we work with them like, the whole time that they're at the Saki Bartman Center. Wow. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for that. So we're going to take another another quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to go on with our conversation. So for those that's watching at home, I urge you to not go anywhere. We'll be back after this. All right, guys, welcome back. You're still watching Open Studio right here on Cape Town TV. I've got Bernadine with me in the studio, like I mentioned earlier. Oh, she's, got, she's from uh, the Saki Brotman um, Center for Women and Children. Uh, they're doing an amazing work in trying to ease the pain of GBV, which we know as gender-based violence on women and children. So just to continue with our conversation, uh, Bernadine, we spoke about you know human trafficking. We spoke mm -hmm. about gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And now we're going into kids, You know, mm -hmm. speaking about children. You mentioned within your center, Children tend to come with the parents mm -hmm. or with the mothers. With the mothers. So, do you what kind of trauma mm -hmm. are they facing? You know, having to witness yeah. this kind of violence within the house. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you guys deal with it? Right, Danny. So, the research is telling us that children and a large percentage of them, some um, pieces of research are saying up to seventy percent of children that have been exposed to domestic violence in the home mm -hmm. um, are then liable to become either a perpetrator of violence themselves or a victim or survivor of, yeah. of gender-based violence. So that's where that intergenerational cycle of abuse mm. comes into it. And if we don't have programs that actually assist children, then we're damning the next generation to be subjected to violence and abuse as well. So we work very closely with our children yeah. to make sure that they're getting the therapy mm. and all the specialist um, um, services that they need to actually heal yeah. from the trauma and go forward and actually be free from abuse. Yeah. So when you deal with these with these issues, you've got the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, the victim goes through this program to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, to heal mm -hmm. and become better. But then what about the, the perpetrator? You know, is anything done for them? Because this family might have to go mm -hmm. back to that person. That's right. Yeah. So Danny, that is a big problem. So our biggest challenges as a shelter is trying to get a woman housing after she leaves the shelter and to make sure that she's got a job. Yeah. So economic empowerment of women has to go hand in hand with healing from, from abuse and, and GBV. Mm. Otherwise, she's going to go back to the perpetrator because he's the one that holds the, the purse strings. Yeah. So um, we work very closely with her while she's at the center. She goes through accredited job skills training mm. so that when she leaves, that she's likely to get a job when she goes back into the community. Okay. So it's really important that, that she gets all the tools she needs. She would get um, basic IT skills training, okay. just the, all the things that she would need to be actually back on in the in the community, but it, being able to procure jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really really important for us um, that she isn't furthered in subjected to having to go back to the perpetrator. When it comes to the perpetrators at the centre, we do do reunification. Um, support services with families that want to. Okay. Often a woman would come in, she's been a, um, exposed to abuse, but she doesn't want to leave the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. She wants to stay at the center, go through the program. But when she's finished the program, she asks us, will we work with the family to yeah. reunify the family? And we would do that. That's some of the work we do do with mm -hmm. perpetrators, specific perpetrators to, to, to families. And that's only at the request of the woman, obviously. Okay. So she has full agency. She can decide. We don't say to her, you mustn't go back to, to the perpetrator. Mm. It's about giving her the power to make the decision herself, yeah. right? Um, and then 
Over and above that, that is obviously one of the things that we really start to need to be looking at in the GBV sector in South Africa, and particularly within Cape Town, is perpetrator programs. Yeah. Because I always say that the woman comes to the Saki Bartman's door, she comes through the gate, but the perpetrator then just moves on to the next survivor. Exactly. So we need to be able to start working with mm -hmm. perpetrators. And there are a number of models th that are running overseas that have to do with education and awareness, but also therapy that are yeah. working. So that's the next that's the next goal. So how, how effective is the unification program? It, the unification program is, is, is effective. Perpetrator programs are particularly difficult um, across the board and that's why I think a lot of people haven't put perpetrator programs in place because it's very difficult to deal with mm -hmm. but it's not impossible so I think we really should see the opportunity take up the challenge and start working yeah. with perpetrators. Uh, I would imagine well for me listening now I would assume that uh, is that because they, they do not come to the program or mm. is it because they are still, you know, controlled by these substances that they might mm. be probably taking and they do not yes. want help? Yes, I think it's a bit of both. Mm. Um, and also the therapy that is needed to actually reform a perpetrator. You need intensive therapy. Yeah. You need the buy-in of the entire family as well. So um, a perpetrator needs to understand what the impact of his abuse had on the family. Yeah. So it's, it's a matter of taking the information from, from his wife or girlfriend, whoever it is, and say, this is the impact that your abuse on me had, um, a psychological um, impact, your, your mental impact, yeah. your um, physical impact, and taking the information from the children as well and saying, you know, Dad, this is what, this is what I, I experienced, sleeplessness, um, you know, and the ramifications for yeah. children that are exposed to abuse are huge. It runs from physical symptoms all the way up to attendance at school yeah. and being able to concentrate at school. So we really need to start working with perpetrators and with the children. Wow. So how long does the program go for when once a, a, a woman comes into the center? Mm -hmm. What is the duration of stay? The first um, stage is for four months. So she's with us for four months at the first stage. Once she's left the, the actual first stage sheltering, she can apply to stay in our cottages that are on our premises. Mm -hmm. That's what we call second stage housing. And that's for a further six months. So these are all fully furnished cottages. She stays there independently with okay. her children. And most of the women in the second stage housing have already got jobs. It's just a further step towards her empowerment for her. So she's got some support from the center, like um, therapy, and we provide food and all the rest, but she's almost back in the community, which okay. is what the goal is. Okay, so it's progressive. Yes, progressive. absolutely. Wow. So, you know, go at, we always believe go at the pace yeah. of the survivor. Wow, and that's mm. a lot of work that you guys mm. are doing. Mm. Uh, you know, you're dealing with different people, different emotions, mm. and how is the staff? What is your 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 mental state? What are you doing to to stay sane? You know, mm. so that you can be able to help mm. these people. I'm very proud to say that I have a fantastic staff component. Yeah. Um, our staff complement sets at 36 at the moment. They're all dedicated. They're all passionate about what they do, and they're all driven every single day to empower women and children to get over the the, the abuse and the trauma. So they're amazing. Yes, it does take a mental um, toll. It takes a psychological toll, it takes an emotional toll on working with women that are going through so much pain. Um, but the difference for us is we get to see the improvement. So we see her when she walks in, she might be closed off like this, yeah. and by the time she's walking out the door, she's an entirely different person. She even looks different. Mm. So we see that progress. I always yeah. say working in Saki Apartment is not a job. It's a privilege. Yeah. Every single day, it's a privilege to serve people mm -hmm. because we see the progress. We see the healing. Wow. Um, so that that that's where we get it. And obviously, we have a lot of debriefing and we have a lot of therapy ourselves. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, it's beautiful to see the smile on your face when mm -hmm. you speak about mm -hmm. how much you are doing to help these mm -hmm. people. And, you know, they, they are not being charged, but yet you, you give your base, you, you feed them, you help them. So if there's anybody out there right now that's been looking for help, but do not know where to go. Mm. You know, they're listening to you now. Mm. They want to come for, to, to, to mm. your center. So where can they find you? Where are you situated? And, mm -hmm. you know, how can you get a hold of right. you? Right. Okay, so I'd just like to say to all the women um, and girls out there that need assistance, that there are resources, that there is assistance, that we are out there to help. With the National Shelter Movement of South Africa has just put up a new hot helpline for women survivors of GBV for them to find shelters. Mm -hmm. It's actually at the Saki Bartman Center. We launched it yesterday, I'm very proud to oh, say. Wow, okay. The very first dedicated 24-7 national heart hotline for uh, women GBV survivors. So that number is 0800 001 
five, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to place them in a shelter near to wherever they are and to help them to get protection orders and to get through the police uh, process, you know, the criminal yeah. charges and all the rest. So we're there to help them. And the Saki Barton Center is obviously in Athlone, and they can call us on 021-633-5287. There we go. Thank you so much. So, you know, as we wrap up now from 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 our crew, really mm. want to say thank you to you, thank you and your organization for the amazing work that you are doing. And for those that's watching at home, thank you so much for being part of the conversation. Thank you for tuning in to all the end from the Cape Town TV crew and my side. We say goodbye till next time.